Olá, bom dia a todas e todos. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the seminar Printing Fiocruz Caps. It is an initiative of discussion and international exchange between Brazil and Germany. I start giving a warm welcome to these members of this discussion table. Soon we're going to introduce them individually. Initially, I would like to remind you of the main purpose of this discussion. We started in April with the main seminar bringing the fostering German fostering agencies that already are part of the support of the education of Brazil, the support in relation to this, the support of studies and research of Germany. And we are having the seminar to exchange experiences with researchers from Brazil and Germany. Initially, without introducing the members of the roundtable individually, I'm going to pass the floor to our um, Dean of Education and General Coordinator of Education of Fio Cruz, Christina Gillen, to give you the initial welcome to this event. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you very much, Vinicius. Can you, can you hear me well? It's a big joy for me to be here as between Fiocruz and Germany is already traditional and very dear to our institution. I would like to thank Vinicius very much for sharing with me this decision of coordinating the project of internationalization of our institution. Vinicius and all of the other colleagues, coordinators of this project, which represent here, that are represented here, Luiz, Luzia, I'm very, uh, I miss very much the snacks that she brought to Rio from Minas. I'm sure that we are going to be able to be together again soon. I would like to thank Marcelo Pelagio, Magali, for her time, for taking her time to be here with us today and exchange these experiences with our foreign guests. I'm very happy that they're here today. We have Stefan, André Felipe, and I'd like to thank very much our team of Video Saúde that enabled these virtual events very uh, constantly in our institution since the pandemic started and we couldn't be here face to face anymore. So thank you very much Video Saúde for giving us the support. Thank you very much to our team from CGE for um, organizing this event. And I'll pass the floor to Vinicius so that we can enjoy as much as we can this moment. I'm giving this gre these greetings as a dean and also from President Lizia and Vice President of Communication, Cristiane Vieira. So welcome to you all. Thank you very much, Cristina, for this introduction. And I would like to hear a little bit from Marcelo Pelagio, a research from the Osvaldo Cruz Institute. As I mentioned during our last... Cristina already thanked Marcelo, but one of the biggest reasons for everything that is happening is Marcelo. We have put together a work group between Field Cruz and Germany. Marcelo has a very large experience with the uh, relationships with Germany and Marcelo coordinates our work group that also counts on the researchers Hugo Kairi, Rafael Freitas, Magali Robert, who is here with us today. And we have this attempt of exchanging experiences and we hope to have future specific webinars, having a researcher from Fio Cruz and a researcher from Germany who already have interactions or want to have interactions in the future. Marcelo, I pass the floor to you so that we can discuss a little bit of that. 
He is a Master of International Affairs with Germany. So go ahead, Marcelo. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Vinicius, for the kind introduction. I would like to greet Christina and everyone who is here at the round table, everyone who is watching us live or in the recorded version. During these talks that we have had in this group, as Christina mentioned, we already have international relationships with Germany for a long time. It is included in the history of development of our institution. We're going to hear one of the testimonials today uh, about a researcher's experience. He is one of the biggest researchers that the Institute already had. We had some collections that came from Germany and this relationship, the scientific relationship that we have with the institutions, exchanging knowledge with different Germany institutions is something that is very important for us and fits the context of a program as uh, print. We need to work on this interaction and the publication so that the students and the scientists can enjoy more and more this context in the future. During this pandemic scenario, uh, last April, we already had a first event with the agencies to discuss the scenario and how the internationalization was going to be and how we could return this work, how Germany is thinking about it. So we brought a representative of CAPS and we started a sequence of scientific dialogues with the presence of with the, with the representative of the Museum of Medicine from Berlin, bringing this perspective even though there's a lot of uncertainty for the scenario because of the current situation. But we have to start thinking about how we can recover and resume these activities little by little. Along those lines, the disclosure of what the um, in Germany the institutions opened their doors to receive other institutions, which they call traditionally the Open Doors Day. Here in the institution, we have something that remember rem that remember this day. We have a similar model, and it's very common from the scientific institutions to um, literally open the doors to the po popular to the public to the general population, so that they can know the professionals to uh, publish, to make public their uh, volunteer programs. And with this, um, with this pandemic, DAD adapted this logics of open doors to the open windows. So an event that is happening today, it started yesterday, it continues tomorrow from 5 p.m. and Friday from the end of the morning. Tomorrow at 5 p.m., Fio Caruso is invited to the event. We're going to speak a little bit about uh, Fio Cruz in the context of the event. And in those three days, DAD is going to discuss the programs that it has uh, developed, what are the opportunities of uh, internship programs, what are the representations in Brazil? What are the modalities of exchange programs that they can uh, finance? Now, the represent, their representatives in Sao Paulo. And due to this event from GAAD that is going to happen on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on the 7th, 9th, and 11th, we had this idea within the work group to put together this event that we are having right now, where we're going to gather some of the colleagues of the institution to hear them a little bit about their experience, about how was their time in Germany, 
colleagues that are there right now and that were um, that were fellows of GAD or other agencies so that we can understand the atmosphere of the open window week in Germany so that we can have an institutional internal interaction. I was a little bit um, more, uh, I took a little bit more time than I should, but I'm going to pass the floor now. Have a good event and have a good day, everyone. Thank you, Marcelo. I'm sure that we are going to have an excellent event. And you never speak more than you should. Your words are very necessary. Marcelo has been a great partner of the print program. And during this initiative, this more specific initiative of the international education between Fiocruz and Germany. I'm not even going to introduce our guests. Actually, from now on, Christina, myself, and you are going to pass the floor to our moderators that were invited, Professor Luzia Carvalho, who is one of the coordinators of projects within the PRINT program. She is the professor of graduation in health sciences from Fiocruz Minas. And I invite Luzia Helena Carvalho with Magali Romero Sá, who is also our colleague from Casa Oswaldo Cruz. She's a professor of uh, the graduation program of history and science of health. They are two researchers and two professors who have been with them. Experience in the area of research and um, the relationship with Germany. Marcelo already said it. The goal is to have a round table, a, a round of informal discussions with the Brazilian researchers that had, have, had had experiences in Germany in different ways, and also uh, re, uh, German researchers. Stefan is going to be introduced, which also shows the relationships with the research institutions here in Brazil. So, Lia, uh, Luzia and Magali, the floor is yours. You can moderate the next part of our roundtable. Thank you, Vinicius. First of all, Magali and I, we said that we we're going to do a brief introduction of the guests because actually the idea is to have them tell their story. So they are going to introduce themselves to our researchers and to our uh, students so that the students could see three successful examples from Germany. I have the honor of dividing this, um, sharing this moderation with Magali. She is the one who is an expert with uh, the relationships between Brazil and Germany. And I'm going to introduce Bernardo and Stefan very briefly. And, and, and André. And we're going to pass the floor to them. And at the end, we're going to open for discussions, which is going to be, I think, very rewarding. Thank you very much to you all. I'm going to briefly start with Bernardo, who is our first um, speaker. You can see that Bernardo is very young. You can see by his face, he is extremely young, but he is already a leader of a research group in the Institute of Innate Immunity of the University of Bonn. He already established his research group there. He receives a lot of Brazilians there. He receives students from all over the world. He works with innate immunity and inflammation, not only in infectious diseases and parasite diseases, but also in chronic and degenerative diseases. And Bernardo has a very interesting story because he had his degree in Brazil at Fiocruz. He started his scientific initiation, master's and doctor's degree here at Henechu. I'm not to give, going to give a lot of details because he's going to introduce himself, but he won the Kraft Awards from the, for the best thesis of medicine too. And I got to know Bernardo more closely when he finished his doctor's degree and he's going to do, he came to do his first postdoc with me to work on malaria. And he was also given an award 
Where he goes, he gets awards. So working with me, he won an international award for the whole Latin America. For a young researcher, he just defended his dissertation and he did a work, a project on malaria, and he brought this PCR machine to Fiocruz Minas. And after that, Bernardo did his second postdoc in Germany. And he already received many awards, as I said. He did two postdocs before he had a most more definite position in Germany. And he got many awards, including from Alexander von Humboldt. And throughout these years, uh, Bernardo has received many researchers from USP, the University of Sao Paulo. He received a student of mine for a sandwich doctor's degree there. It was a very successful experience, a great experience to my researcher who's still in Germany. Papers published, some of them in great journals with great contribution to the science and he already received people from all over the world. I can say that I have contributions in his personal life because his wife was my student in scientific initiation. So I'm very, he's very dear to me. I can say that Stefan is a professor in the Department of Parasitology from UFMG, the Federal University of Minas Gerais, but he is a former student here at Henry Hachus, and he did the contrary path of what Bernardo did. He is German, he did a master's in biology, a doctor's in parasitology in Germany, and he came to Brazil for the first time 22 years ago, right, Stefan? He came to Brazil for the first time to do a postdoc with a DAAD grant with a partnership with CNPQ. He was in Fiocruz Cruz Minas Gerais for two years. He returned to Germany and he came back as a visiting research in a partnership between Fiocruz Cruz and the University of Georgetown in the United States. And he stayed six to eight years as uh, eight years at NHSU. We call Stefan for all projects. He was very willing. He went to Pará, he went to many other cities of Brazil and in Germany as well. And he established himself here. He put together a group. He works with the intestinal elements, with several parasites in the area of immune response and diagnosis. He already oriented several Brazilian students for their masters and doctors. And he has over 60 publications I would like to thank you both, and I'm going. I, I was, it's going to be very interesting to hear you both. Stefan and I to, uh, drank a lot of beer together. Bernardo didn't drink, but we drank for Bernardo. So I'm going to pass the floor to Magali, who is going to introduce Andre. Thank you very much to you both. Thank you, Lucia. I would like to thank all of the partners and to all of the speakers and everyone who is here today. I think we have successful stories here. It's a great pride for us as professors and researchers at the institution to be able to um, introduce such brilliant people that are part of our round table. Andre also has a very nice story, a very successful story. He works at Casa de Osvaldo Cruz in the Department of history and sciences of health. He is part of the graduation program of history and science of health. He has a very awarded and interesting history. He did his sandwich doctor's degree with the uh, grant from DAAD in Germany, working with the history of relationships between Brazil and Germany. He is going to speak about this. He is one of the great researchers that we had in the institution, and then he became one of the great researchers in Germany. So Andre Philippe also has several works published. He has an interesting background because he studied microbiology at the Federal University of Rio. And then he fell in love with history. 
He studied history at the State University of Rio. Andre Felipe was also awarded. Thesis was also awarded by CAPS. And it has this amazing interaction. Working with tropical medicine. He works with public health and the history of the Amazon. He is dedicating now to schistosomosis. It's very interesting to mention now. He's going to have many interesting things to tell us, and I think I'm going to let him talk a little bit about this. So I wish you all a great morning, and we're here with you. Have a great lecture, everyone. Bernardo, we're going to start with you. Vocês conseguem ver minha tela? Can you see my screen? Thank you very much, Lizzie, for the words. You're going to see in my slides that you have an influence in my story and in my background. I confess that I think it's very boring to present my resume. We only we are this show. Some points that led me through the path that I decided to take, but highlighting the personal decisions and the people who influenced me, especially highlighting that in a scientific career, especially today where everything is more. And mostly luck and the people that you find along the way. Something that helped me was having some kind of a lighthouse, some kind of a north that started during my doctor's degree. After, before the doctor's degree, I didn't know much what I was going to do, what I liked. And I wanted to understand about cytokines. I'm from Minas Gerais, I'm from Belo Horizonte. I did my undergraduate degree in the Federal University of Minas. In 2000, it was the first time that I entered the laboratory. I entered Fiocruz and the Federal University of Minas Gerais doing scientific initiation. Sometimes we didn't have grants. We worked for free. We worked with different things. Uh, in the first laboratory, I worked with malacology, so I worked with mal um, I worked with uh, Erika Braga, Paulo Filemol, and all of the people. Uh, and then I worked at the different laboratory, working with mosquitoes working with saliva from the malaria mosquitoes, the immune evasion mechanisms of Trypanosoma cruz. Few cruz focused very much on parasitary uh, diseases. That's where I started. And during my doctorate, I worked with Dr. Ricardo Gazzinelli. I started working with malaria again focused on the immunity of malaria. And the doctors, the doctorate was when things started to get consolidated in terms of which would be the topic that I would like to work with and follow my career. And luckily, by coincidence, by fate, or by something else, that opened all of the fields where I worked afterwards. And also the people that I had the pleasure to get to know. Unfortunately, some of them you're not going to get to know because they passed away. I met an amazing person, but also an opportunity to work in the endemic field. I went to Amazonas, I went to Manaus, I worked with Marcos Lacerda there, and I saw what was malaria, the daily life of the patients, if you look at the papers, these people that I these were the people that I met. 
And this experience were a lot, were worth a lot more than the papers. Of course, from all of those things, my head changed, my mind changed, and noticed that my thesis was about malaria, but uh, in Ricardo's laboratory, I was exposed to this video that has a lot to do with my passion and took me to what I do today, which is cytokines. We can see the toxoplasma, toxoplasm bond. This is a very improvised video made by a biophysics called Obiratan from the UFMG. And he shows a macrophage and the infectious form of the macrophage. You can see that the macrophage is there and the parasite forces its entrance inside the macrophage. It invades the macrophage and establishes the infection. When you take the same macrophage and you use interferon gamma and oxytocin and anti-inflammatory, the macrophage rea reacts differently. You see the same scenario where the parasite tries to invade the macrophage. And what happens at the end of the day is that the macrophage phagocytes parasites and you don't have an infection. Today, when compared to what we do with microscopy today is a very bizarre video, but uh, the, me the message of this video is in my mind until today, how one cytokine like interferon gamma can change completely the results of this phenomenon. It has to have time to act on the receptor, get to the nucleus, produce new molecules, RNA protein and change the phenotype and the behavior of the cell. So from this moment during the doctorate, I understood that I wanted to understand cytokines. And that was part of my trajectory in malaria, which is a disease that we heard, we hear about cytokine storm and COVID. But in malaria, we have something similar. Patients with malaria, what kills them is a kind of a septic shock. And I had the possibility of studying that in patients in the endemic field. And during my doctorate, I also had the opportunity of spending some time uh, uh, in the laboratory of Douglas Gullenbach and the University of Massachusetts, the UMass. Um, and that's where I got to know the people who took me to Germany. So the people that I know knew back there brought me to Germany. So I can't say that I planned this in my career. The new students have to do that. They have to test out all the things until they find something that they like. And it's the doors are going to open. Douglas is fantastic. He received me at his laboratory. He taught me many things. We, in my thesis, in my dissertation from my doctorate, we talk about the role of toll-like receptors in malaria. And we show that when you block these DNA sensors in the cell, you eliminate the, the cytokines that are dangerous in malaria, and you revert that situation with, that you see in the endemic area. Patients who have malaria, but they coexist well with parasites. One kills the other. This is because the balance between the immune response and the presence of the parasite may happen through those toe-like receptors. Of course, the story is longer than that. Going back to Brazil, I finished the doctorate and I went to work with Luzia, doing my postdoc with her. And my interest with those cytokines and malaria and other diseases afterwards was understanding what causes those cytokines and malaria? What are the triggers? What activates the cytokines and malaria? So in this one year that I spent in her laboratory, that was when I got married with my, my wife because I met her in her laboratory. We identified the circulating cell-free DNA and the pathogens 
And that opened up an area for biomarkers in malaria, but also a new layer of understanding about the production of cytokines in malaria. So I was in Brazil, I worked with malaria, but I had my cytokine in focus. Cytokines work in several diseases, not only in malaria, you can see now with COVID. Cytokine can be protectors against um, diseases, but L1 cytokine can, for example, create a several array of diseases. We call L1 diseases. I used to call them rich people diseases. And the cytokine L1 is uh, controlled by what we call inflammasomes. When I came to Germany, one of the techniques that we use here to look at a phosphorylation, um, I didn't know, I used it very little. I left a doctorate that was awarded. And when I came here to German, Germany, I became uh, in scientific initiation again from ICA's student who taught me everything again. So it was very humbling to come back to a learning stage and that opened up many things for us. Today is the line, it's the line that I follow in my laboratory. And I was one of the first postdocs of ICA. He was starting, that is another soft factor. When you join a laboratory of a researcher that is new, that still has to show themselves, he's going to do everything for you to be successful. He is not the leader of a huge laboratory with 30 postdocs where five or two lab, uh, laboratory members can fail and it's okay. And that was essential. I had many support from, much support from him and from the group. The group was small, but they were very, they were very skillful with the techniques. So life in Germany was, uh, I did the postdoc there and then I started to have my first students and things changed when I, took all of my training, all the people that I met in Brazil, all my knowledge about inflammation, all that I knew about NA immunity and what I learned about chronic inflammation, non-infectious diseases. And I started to come up with new questions, other branches that gave me more money. And I was able to consolidate a research group in a, a German uh, university. In 2018, I was appointed as a professor of immunology, and it is a, I, I love that position. I have many resources, and as Luzia said, I still have links in Brazil. I'm a visiting professor of CRID. I'm sorry for the mistake in the slides from uh, the medicine school of Ribeirão Preto. So twice a year, I used to go two times a year to Ribeirão Preto to offer a discipline in uh, innate immunity with practice and theory. When I got to Bonn, it was very easy to fall in love with the city of Bonn. And that could be witnessed by this photo all of the students who went to Bonn to spend six months, they never came back. It is known as the green heart of Europe. It is a very green city. You can see the whole city here. This photo is by a friend of mine who was a photographer. And the air is pure. There, there are mountains. There are many things to do. But it is also... If you look at the most beautiful places in the world, you're going to um, look, see the, the street from Bonn. We have uh, Japanese cherry blossoms that they bloom after the Second World War. So we do annual photos of our families there that we do every, we take every April. April. We have the university that is very, um, Young, it is a university of over 200 years. We have Freud who taught there, uh, Karl Marx studied there. 
It is an excellent university. It received awards for many years. And this photo actually is from two papers from Nature highlighting Bonn, the University of Bonn, as a center to attract talents from all over the world. So when I got here, it was already like this, and I met a very rich environment, not only financially, but culturally and critically rich. We have access to equipment. If you have a mass spectrometer, one of the experts in the world is at the end of the hall from you. It is something amazing. You sit down to have lunch with people, you develop an idea, and you have resources at the reach of your hand. And we moved to a very modern and very new building with an, an amazing infrastructure. And as I said, I don't like to talk about my resume and many things that I say you can find at the website of these institutes if you're interested. Basically, my research group today works with platelets and innate immunity and in cancer. We look for novel inflammasome regulators. In this intracellular complex that I just mentioned, uh, we look for ways to um, new therapeutic targeting of inflammasomes for chronic inflammatory diseases. Um, and we also test crystal formation and in inflammatory diseases. Last one that we have seen are crystals formation, crystal formation in asthma and the lungs. Lungs. The crystals that are formed in asthma sometimes last forever in people. We have a very nice structure, as I said. This is my laboratory. There are a lot of space, a lot of equipment. I have people from India, France, Spain, Brazil, many Brazilians here, my, me included, Colombia, Israel, Italy. I'm happy to show this to you. And I'm willing to answer any question that you might have about how is an experience in a German university. Thank you very much. Okay, and my camera's on now. Thank you very much, Bernardo, for this amazing explanation. It was incredible very instigating and we want to go to Bonn now it seems very interesting the city seems beautiful I'm going to answer open for questions at the end but before I'm going to and before I pass to Stefan I'm going to read a comment from Pedro da Silva who is from the Embassy of Brazil in Berlin he says very happy to see another event that celebrates the exchange of technology and information between Germany and Brazil. Congratulations, Phil Cruz, Caps, and the researchers. Pedro Ivo, he is the head of science and technology of information from the Embassy of uh, Brazil in Berlin. Now I'm going to pass the floor to Stefan Geiger, and we're going to have questions at the end after the presentation by André Felipe Cândido da Silva. Stefan, the floor is yours. First of all, good morning, everyone. I'm going to share my presentation with you. You can see it. Okay, now it's in full screen. First of all, I would like to thank you for the invitation. And I would also like to congratulate the organizers for the event. It is a very important event. Many governments also always force these exchanges. And today our work is not only 
in the international office is all over the world. I would like to thank especially Lucia and Magali for the invitation. I would like to talk about my professional life. I did a very succinct presentation and not very scientific. I'm just going to talk to you about my stages in my professional life. I'm going to talk about the, my background, professional work, my past and current uh, orientations and other activities of final considerations. And I'm always going to link those items with my story with DAAD, the German Academic Exchange Service, because DAAD was a big driver of my professional life and my position today. I had an undergraduate degree. <laughs> Lizzie already said most of my background, but I had an undergraduate degree at the University, University of Tübingen at Bath at Bad Kaus University at Tübingen. And during my uh, undergraduate studies, there was already a great exchange between the Catholic University of Porto Alegre. So there, all, there was always Brazilians there and German people doing master's and doctor's degrees in Porto Alegre. So there, I was already very much interested by the project. And I started taking Portuguese lessons with Brazilians who uh, taught the students, the undergraduate students at the University of Tübingen. I did uh, conversation classes for three semesters and I got the Brazilian fever. Then I'm, I did a master's degree with emphasis on zoology and parasitology. So I was already directed towards parasitology and parasitology agents. agents. And then I did also a doctorate in parasitology, also in the University of Tübingen. As Bernardo said about the University of Bonn, it is also a very old university founded in 1477. Today, I'm not sure about the exact number of students, but at the time it had 27,000 students approximately. And what I found at the page of the university, because at the time we didn't have those rates, the university, the, those fees, the university charges for foreign students a graduation fee of 3,000 euros. And I believe it is an annual fee, like a tuition. It is a photo, this is a photo of the um, old city with the Neca River that goes through it. It is a small city similar to Bonn. We have about 88,000 residents and 27 to 28 students. So during the semester, the, the city is full of students and during the recess, the city and the bars are more empty. I did my graduation studies in the School of Biology. At the time I did all of the courses that I had to take in parasitology and then I joined the master's course. I did the master's degree after my under graduation course, I worked with uh, I worked in tropical medicine with the specific model for Filarius. I worked at the laboratory laboratory bench related closely to Tübingen, but the group had the strong trait of field work. So the groups were never at the laboratory, they are always with patients. At the end of my master's degree, I had the possibility of doing an internship program in Africa. 
working with patients with sarcosis. And I received the offer from Professor Hartwig to do a doctorate at the University of Tübingen. At the time, professor from the Porto Alegre Catholic University that had nothing to do with the project already contacted Professor Hartwig, which was Professor Carlos Greff Teixeira from Catholic University of Porto Alegre, who today is from the Federal University of Espírito Santo. And he became a collaborator of Professor Hartwig. And since I didn't have my doctorate project yet, Carlos always worked with Angel Strongelus Costaricensis. I had the option of working experimentally with Angel Strongelus because there were a lot of gaps still in the immune response of the parasites and experimental models. And I also received Professor Carlos in Tübingen, and we worked on some projects together. So I took care of the project, and I also was the person that was taking care of Professor Carlos in Tübingen so that he didn't lose himself in the Neca River. I was able to get a connection with the new parasites and with the connection of, with Latin American Professor Carlos Teixeira. From then on, we had many works they are not so important in this context, but we had some joint works with patients from Africa. And Tubingen is also a very receptive uh, city with a lot of beer, many bars. And at least during the summer, the climate of the city is very pleasant. And then, at the end of my doctoral studies with these connections in Brazil, my boss and the group put together this international project with intestinal uh, hemiotosis, and we had new contacts in Fiocruz in Rio to know if we could find a collaborator for our projects for us to collaborate with Brazil. And at that time, I don't remember the name of the researcher in Rio, but the researcher in Rio said, I'm at the end of my career. I wouldn't be the right person for this project, but I know Rodrigo Correia Oliveira from Belo Horizonte, and he works with immunology, infections. So I've, wrote, I've written a project for my postdoctoral studies for DAAD in collaboration with CNPQ PQ. and in 98 I was able to receive my scholarship and I went to Belo Horizonte in 1999, in March, after Carnival. They told me, you don't have to come before Carnival. We only start working after Carnival. So I went in March. So in the beginning, the scholarship was for one, for one year. And I think Rodrigo, because he opened the doors to me And Rodrigo was a great manager. In reality, he opened the doors and put the students and in the infrastructure of the lab at my disposal. And he put the necessary people in contact with me. And one of the most important people who went to the field with me was Cristiano Lara Massara. So with this scholarship of around 2,600 reais for one year, I was able to start my work in the immunology lab. And it was kind of funny, even awkward, when we had the, the meeting 
for the DAAD, for the new postdoctoral students that would receive that grant, I found out that I was the only one for Latin America. And the great majority would go to the United States, Canada, England, and other countries. with countries which had more acknowledged research with institutions that were stronger. And at that time I found, found that I was being isolated, but then I understood that it was great. I, I, I spent three months there and then uh, I stayed for one more year because the field work was not so easy. We couldn't schedule in details as we wished. So we, the work was delayed and at the end, our research took two years and a half instead of one year. And everything was done within the lab of Rodrigo Correa Oliveira and in collaboration with Cristiano Lara Massara and I owe them a lot because they received me with open arms. And then we were able to develop some works, works that we planned, that we were willing to do, always working with the poorest areas in Minas Gerais. And then after two years and a half, I opted to come back to Germany to try my luck in Germany due to part particular reasons. And after two years and a half, I was able to get a position as an assistant uh, professor in the uh, Munchen University in the Institute of Tropical Medicine, Comparative and Parasitological uh, Tropical Medicine. And it was very awkward when we we started uh, working with the administration. They had assistants there and we were the assistants and we were going to sign the contract and they and people told us, all of you, you have five years and then five years and then you, you have to become professors after that or you have to leave. That was a great uh, surprise to me and my colleagues and we were not sure if we would be able to do that. So we were able to work there and put together what we needed. We, we developed this research project, ProBau, exchanging with people from the Federal University of Minas Gerais. I was able to send Professor Musu Ribeiro. So we were able to exchange, we developed joint works with TICS, e foi para frente, eu intercâmbio começou, os trabalhos saíram. A professora Lígia, ela foi como assistente lá na Universidade de Munique. E eu depois de dois anos, dois anos e meio, eu já fiz as minhas malas. After two years or two years and a half, I did my path again to go back to Field Cruise. Mais uma vez fui chamado pelo I was invited again by Rodrigo and Jeffrey Batten for Bethany for a good project with the Sustanites, Sustanite, a project of vaccination where we tested the vaccine on the field here in Minas Gerais and we did basic studies about vaccines and immunologies, epidemiologies, and uh, we in this project, I stayed from 2004 to 2010, always as a visiting professor of Hene Ashun and an adjunct professor from, associate professor from the George Washington University. A lot of projects came up, came out of there, and we worked on the field a lot, but experimentally as well at Hene Ashun, and that's where I got to know Professor Ricardo Fujiwara, who is my colleague today here, 
in parasitology. After six or seven years in the oscillosomites project, I left the project and I chose to do another visiting professor activity in the group of Dr. Alinda Sismachins Phil, working with the Chagas disease and the diagnosis of Chagas disease. I thank Nino very much because he accepted me. I already met him since 2009. I got to know him very well, but my project was, my subject was never Chagas disease. I already worked with diagnosis, but he opened his doors for me. And I, he gave me the chance to get to know another part of parasitology and get, get to know the asymmetry of fun, fungi more. While we were still in the project of the acelostomites vaccine, and before we left the project, and I had a colleague that was also doing his postdoc in Heneashu. And at the end of the acelostomites project, there's always a point where you ask themselves, where are you want to be in your life? If you want to be in the Lo Horizonte or if you want to go back to Germany. And every year this question becomes heavier. Another year in Brazil, another year uh, far from Germany with less contact. And every year the weight was in Brazil. So we did the um, acknowledgement of the diplomas so that I could enroll myself in public uh, admission programs to try to apply for a definitive spot as a researcher or as a professor in a university. I went to, I went through two public selection admission programs where I was not classified. So it didn't go ahead, and then I didn't give up. I spent some time at the private university of Univali in Governador Valadares to gather more experience on teaching and um, as a professor. I went through my first work as a researcher at Institute of Andrushagas in Belém, where I was a researcher at the laboratory of schistosomosis and intestinal parasitosis. I went there for almost a few months, for only a few months, because at the time there was also a public content, a public selection pro process to have an, to be an associate professor here at the University of Sao Paulo for the parasitology department. I never thought that I was going to be able to be here at the University of Sao Paulo, but I took the test and I was classified. I passed in the first place. And a few months later, I accepted my position in Belém. I Lastly, went to the Department of Parasitology and Biological Diseases of the University of Minas Gerais. Today, I teach undergraduate, undergraduates and graduates. On immunodiagnosis, I think this is I think this contact, frequent contact with the students can be very tiring, but also very rewarding. It is a very nice exchange. We also receive sometimes students from abroad. There are people from all over the world trying to uh, join the graduate studies here. There was a student from France and there is a student now from Ecuador. And now during the pandemic, I'm not sure how he 
uh, he's going to the university if he was dismissed or not. But we have this exchange and there's a lot of flow from people from abroad. I took many administrative positions, both in parasitology and USB, USP and uh, UFMG in general. So I think it contributes to the work of our institution. And today my activities of research are more connected to um, to intestinal diseases, to helminths associated to intestine, helminths associated to def definitive hosts, epidemiology and diagnosis of schistosomosis. And we did some works with the epidemiology of tegumentary leishmaniosis in the north of Minas Gerais. We today have collaborations nationally with the team from the René Hachou Institute, represented by Dr. Paulo Marcos and Cristiano, and people from the laboratory of Dr. Orlando. We still have some pending projects. And we also continue collaborating with the Institute Evandro Chagas. The leader was from Hene Hashu Institute, and he passed in a uh, selection test for Institute of Abra Chagas. We have important national collaborations, and we have some projects with people from the United States and England. Unfortunately, today, I don't have projects funded by DAAD. I would really like to resume this exchange and these projects. Maybe I'm going to contact Bernardo later if he's interested to do some schistosomosis uh, studies. What is very important also in the university nowadays is to do extension projects. And we see by the undergraduate students and by the work group themselves that we have a lot of contact with the population and we do educational projects, social projects at the schools, especially in the city of Januari, where we had an agreement, a covenant until last year, we have a lot of collaboration with the city hall. As I said, our work and our research nowadays is pretty much related to schistosomosis, immune response and diagnosis. Here we have my students, Vanessa Normanju. A Samira, eu sempre esqueço o nome. I always forget her name. Sam, Samira Rezende, who did a nice work in the north of Minas with the patients there. So we always try to get the students out of the laboratory and take them to the field. We developed some works of the graduation courses, Varlin Oliveira, Fernanda Magalhães, and diagnosis of schistosomosis, a, post, a great postgraduate project testing the rapid test of, ur of urine in Januari and the collaboration with the Evandro Chagas Institute from Belém is still going strong. There are a lot of joint projects and works. He also did some work with uh, the diagnosis of toxo toxocaracanis. I have to remember all of the names. Marco Tullio, he did a master's uh, with, uh, about the diagnosis of toxocariasis. Andresa Saldanha did a work with the uh, stray dogs evaluating parasites in the stray dogs. 
So basically, these are our lines of research along Dr. Lino about Chagas disease. And Diogo Tavares did a work about epidemiology of cutaneous leishmaniosis in Minas Gerais, in the municipality of Januari as well. There are many orientations throughout time. This is a student from the University of Limoges, France, that spent some months here at the laboratory completing her master's degree. And I just wanted to tell you that um, that our work and our research and our daily life here is pretty much connected to of Minas and to the parasite diseases that exist there. And the advanced center of treatment and research in leishmaniosis, where we take the postgraduate students, which is our basis to do any study with uh, any with any study about leishmaniosis and so that we can do our field work in partnership with the city hall. I try to take everyone who joins the laboratory to the north of Minas to get to know different realities. So here we don't have beautiful blossom, cherry blossom trees. There's a lot of dirt roads and heat, but it's rewarding all the same. These are some impressions of the graduate students. Professor Alain, who opened his doors for me in the, in the city of Januaria, the San Francisco River, and the city hall members, the students from the laboratory and other collaborating laboratories here in parasitology, collaborators like the Dr. Paulo Marcos, Dr. Edward Oliveira from the Hene Hachu Institute, colleagues from the Department of Parasitology, Professor Deborah Migral, Professor Ricardo Fujiwara, Professor Lilian Lacerda Bueno, with whom we carry out these works in the north of Minas. And recently, this my student, Karine Ferreira earned an honorable mention in the International Symposium of Schistosomosis because of her dissertation and work developed here at the laboratory in collaboration with Edward Oliveira from Hene Hachum Institute. That was a great surprise, a very positive surprise for all of us. And Karine deserved truly I would like to end it with some impressions. The beauty of the Brazilian nature, the reality of the countryside in the north of Minas, what in the end of the day matters the most, my family, either here in Brazil or in Germany, and some other photos of the field work. This last photo here was from a resident of the area who always jokes with me. In 2014, there was the World Cup and we were joking about who's going to work the, win the World Cup. And the bet was if Germany won, he was going to carry the flag of Germany and put it on the pole in front of his house and Germany won and he left the flag there until it fell on the ground. That was our joke in the city of Januari. So with this, I would like to wrap up my presentation. I think I spoke too much. I'm sorry, Luzia, I'm sorry for the time. It was excellent, excellent, Stefan. I think you have a very interesting experience of life from such a rich country to Brazil with so many inequalities for your, from your laboratory work, your field work, and you know the countryside of Minas, you went everywhere. So thank you very much. That was a great presentation. 
I would just like to tell you that we have about 100 people watching us on YouTube. So it is a great experience and I hope the students can enjoy. As Magali said, we're going to leave the discussion to the end. Why Fiocruz lost Stefan? Because he said he was approved by a selection test. At the time, the selection test was I'm not going to say. It was a horrible thing because they did a immunology, a basic immunology test, and they would only select the three highest grades. The first grade was the a, a student that um, just defended his doctorate dissertation. The second one was a person that didn't publish a, a an article for the for ten years. And Stefan was excellent, but he wasn't one of the top three. Just for you to understand why we missed Stefan, we missed Stefan because we lost Stefan because of a horrible criteria of few crews. And he was a super active researcher. It's very good that you were maintained by the Federal University of Minas Gerais, but we have collaboration. So I'm going to pass the floor to André, our next uh, conference speaker. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to share my screen. Before I start, I would like to thank you all for the invitation. I would like to congratulate the organizers it was very interesting to hear Bernardo and Stefan speaking because as you were going to see and as Magali, Ma, as Magali said, the relationships between Brazil and Germany are my project of uh, research. And I studied that from the standpoint of the history of science and history of health. I am a researcher of Casa de Osvaldo Cruz I did my doctor's degree there in history of the science and health. This is the photo of the day I was navigating through the Auster River in Hamburg in April 2010, when I did my doctorate there in the University of Hamburg and the University of Berlin. Something I find interesting from this experience and also from someone who investigates this topic is how the uh, previous speeches from Bernardo and Stefan made clear that those opportunities have very important, significant impressions. Uh, they reorient experiences and also individual existences. I'm not going to go into the second matter, which is going to be more individual, but how those possibilities of exchange that are open, those cooperations, those exchanges, those partnerships, remodel key changes in the research pathways. And I can say that from my path as a historian and as a researcher, as Magali already said, my um, first graduation, the first degree was in immunobiological sciences and immunology on um, in Brazil. But my scientific initiation professor had a strict relationship with uh, Germany and her story was also important. She went to Cologne and she got in touch with a series of techniques of methodologies and she applied that to Brazil and she had a very strong research group at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. So why Germany? Where did those choices come from? I think it's very important to mention that. I love what Bernardo said when he mentioned that the people that we meet in our lives end up being important. And it's very good that Magali is here moderating this table because she was very important for me. She 
uh, helped me with my doctorate thesis. And she was very important in influencing me in that. At the time, I studied a trajectory of the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation and that worked there in 1956. I got in touch with his personal archive and I got to know more about his trajectory. We have three different cases of Brazilians that went to Germany and Germans that went to that came to Brazil and were successful here. I went there, returned to Brazil, and somehow this contact remodeled my uh, research problems and my methodologies and approaches as I'm going to detail further ahead. And Hika da Rocha Lima, this researcher, caught my attention because he had an opposite trajectory than we saw in health. He went to Tropical and Maritime Diseases Institute of Hamburg. This photo on the right is from 1955, when the institute turned 20 years. And this is a photo on the left from 2010, when I went there. It's a beautiful building. It's a very architectural, a very uh, remarkable architectural style from Hamburg. And as it was said here, he developed very strict relationships with the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation, which was called the Osvaldo Cruz Institute at the time. So I decided to study this character, Henrique da Rocha Lima. And for that, I had to face the decision of learning German, which is something that involved a bunch of courage, discipline, investment, and it was highly rewarding because from there, I opened uh, an array of new objects and new topics of future research to which I today. I'm speaking as a historian, so it's interesting to see from uh, social and human sciences, how the acquisition of a language opens a series of possibilities. For us historians who work as um, with research uh, sources, especially. First, I'm going to talk about my sandwich doctorate in 2010, that uh, where I wrote my doctorate thesis, my doctorate dissertation about Enrique da Rocha Lima and the workshop at Institute Max Blunt of Science History in Berlin about colonial subjects of health and differences, races, population and diversities. And my stay, a research stay at the Studi Naufenhalt, where I stayed from September to October 2018 in Germany. First thing I can say is that those possibilities are very simple. They are very accessible to be to be achieved. During my um, internship and sandwich doctorate, those who developed the work there were the researchers Stefan Gult and Ure Schmidt. And then the University of Berlin, I was received by Professor Stefan Bri, who became a partner and uh, with a very close dialogue in our, with our research group. And through him, I returned to Germany between September and October 2018. He is a professor of Latin America studies from the University of Berlin. And there, there are many Latin American students. He always received very well the Brazilians. He's always very available. I would like to take this opportunity to thank him for his availability. And Professor Stefan Huch, that works with a researcher at uh, uh, the University of Berlin, who introduced me to these studies. And the German was an obstacle for me at first, but then it became an excellent opportunity. I started at the Goethe Institute. 
And it's very interesting because at the introduction of my thesis, I comment about this. When we, when I arrived at the CAPES EAD program, DAAD program, there was an event in Bonn in a beautiful day in the summer of Bonn. And at that moment, there were many interesting presentations giving rich information about information about how is life in Germany. And that's when I was able to understand and grasp the, the importance of Henrique da Rocha Lima and the research object that I was dedicating myself to, the relationships between Brazil and Germany. One of the presenters talked about the intercultural competence and dominating those intangible symbols and codes. It's about sociability and language. That's when I was able to get the dimension of Rocha Lima because he was a cultural intermediary between these two academically and culturally diverse worlds and putting put them in contact. He intermediated what we see today. He received many students, both in Germany and he um, influenced the travel of Brazilians to Brazil. When I went to Germany, my main interest was to find new historical sources related to this theme of research. And I should say that the sources that I found, the archives that I come in touch with, extrapolated my initial interest. I was fiddling with those papers last night to prepare this presentation, and it is a robust quantity of themes and research objects that are there because the language is an obstacle. So these historical sources are in German, but I believe when you acquire it, there's a new world that opens up. This photo is photo of the attic of the Tropical Medicine Institute of Hamburg. It is a archive and I used to go there and analyze this archive and photograph it. It is a material to think about the scientific relationships between Brazil and Germany. And it was interesting to listen to Bernardo and Stefan because in the field of parasitology and tropical medicine, these relationships were extremely important for the formation of these disciplines, and I'm happy to see that it, it's still happening. What I would like to highlight is that beyond this existential change that happened to me when I went to a new country, it was my first opportunity to live abroad. It was my first opportunity to live a different culture. But from the academic standpoint, that allowed me a contact with new approaches and new methodologies. Here we have two researchers of the area of biological sciences. We don't have laboratories and research groups this way, but it's very important because from what you have and what you bring back to Brazil, you can look at these new approaches and methodologies that are developed in these other places. So coming in contact with that is very important. Afterwards, I'm going to talk a little bit about the product, products that came up from that. And also this new outlook upon the objects of research from this DAAD encounter, I could get a dimension, a historical dimension, and what was the role of those relationships in the individual path of Rocha Lima. So it's a change in trajectory and research problems and theoretical approach. Many theoretical approaches help us looking at your objects and your themes in a different way. I joked about this title. That is a moment of theoretical renovation of historiography. It's a topic of a collection called New Objects, New Problems, and New Approaches. And I think this is perfectly applicable to what happened to my academic 
trajectory as, as a researcher. New uh, problems and new approaches. I have a book here from uh, Jürgen Osterhammel, Die Verwandlung der Welt, that was being translated at that time, the transformation of the world. And there's a global history of the 19th century. That was completely new for me. That was the first time that I came in contact with this problem, with this discussion and those reflections. They were already being applied to the two seminars of Latin America that I was uh, attending which is thinking about Brazil, not only as a national space and as Latin America, but connected to the rest of the world through processes that are connected, that are shared, the circulation of ideas, people, technologies. This is much more spread in historiography right now. And then we had the opportunity with Magali that always simulated the context with those theoretical news in 2012, we had a discipline trying to discuss those approaches and those discussions. And in terms of new objects, new problems, and new approaches, I expanded a little bit the time scope while thinking about the relationships between Brazil and Germany. I concentrated in the first half of the 20th century. And now, as Magali said, I am studying another individual that had a similar role to the trajectories that were narrated here, which is Hara Sioli, that came to Brazil in 1935 and decided to stay in Brazil. He came during the war. He was arrested during the war before Brazil joined the Allies in 1942. He passed away in 2004, and all of his trajectory was developed around the Brazil, the Amazon uh, ecology. He did cooperation programs with CMPQ and Max Franco Institute of Immunology. And now it is the bio, bio, biology, evolutive biology, Max Franco Institute. Now I am interested in knowing the transnational networks that involve Brazil and Germany, but also other countries in the understanding of Amazon. Magali and I published a chapter in the international collection. It is a subject that we are dedicating to. We're going to develop it even more. We're going to talk also about science, Jewish scientists that migrated to Brazil and also developed very successful trajectories in Brazil. It was, uh, as I said, it was a uh, a personal experience, but also something that guides my work until today. These are some results from this exchange program. I can make them available to you. And what I think it's interesting to say here is how those agreements, bilateral corporations and research states, they are a seedling. They can be a trigger of what is a virtuous cycle of internationalization. We are in a print caps seminar, which is focused on the stimulation of internationalization, the internationalization with Germany in the case of the seminar. But I think it's very welcome because of these factors that I'm incentivizing here, this potential of theoretical and methodological renovation, the contact renovation, for example, in the case of biological science, the recognition of the techniques of laboratory in the case of science, human sciences, the contact with new authors, new discussions, new debates. So I think it's a virtuous cycle of internationalization because this is what internationalization means. I think this is interesting because it has a tradition, it has a story. We know the role of those relationships with Germany and the formation of the scientific tradition of the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation. Here we have a photo of Ginsum and Provajek in the tea house in the very laid back moment. Godoy sitting here with Ginsum, sitting on the table in the front. And we have, a, we have here a very, a very important moment from 1908 
If you don't know the stage of the of Osvaldo Cruz Institute, they came here in 1908 and they taught courses, developed several researches with these researchers from the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation. And that was extremely important for many disciplines like zoology, which is a very interesting uh, study that Magali did, the context between Carlos Chagan and Max Hackman, that was a very important biology that came in, came in 1910. And those were extremely important encounters that uh, led to the discovery of the disease that then took his name, the Chagas disease. It's also important to say how the factors, the institutional factors responsible for the good establishment of the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation, that is the Osvaldo Cruz Institute that is going to become the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation, that is wide, diverse, dynamic, and present. And one of those factors was indeed internationalization. We know about the award that Osvaldo Cruz won in Berlin, and that was incredibly important to transform the Institute into an Institute of Experimental Medicine. And what we see today are agencies like CAPS with uh, strict partnerships with DAAD. These are institutionalized partnerships. They are a result of this comprehensive historical process. We have a lot to learn from them. This is what I would like to present. And it's just for us to see how the complexity of those relationships are and how this is rich in the formation of disciplines and the modeling of those uh, different trajectories. I can witness this from my experiences and my dialogues with Germany. If I didn't take this step today, I would be maybe developing other topics, doing something else. I don't know what, but that could be something very different than it was from that decision. In those opportunities that I had developing part of my trajectory in dialogue with Germany, I identify an important turning point of my history that still reflects until today. And I think that we have to expand those possibilities. I congratulate Marcelo Vinicius and everyone who's involved in this initiative because sometimes we see that way closer than we imagine. I also imagine that will be something distant, but maybe it's a lot closer. We can see here with several examples and your story may change a lot. It takes courage, it takes boldness, it takes challenges, but I think it's extremely rewarding because re-internationalization is the possibility of renewing the scientific knowledge in any area. The other speakers also made it very clear. It's an exchange of culture and this exchange of culture in turn brings new looks new um, approaches worked in different ways and that's when the scientific knowledge is developed and moves on so my my message is along those lines i'm available for questions and for any doubt any question thank you very much andrea now we see some the see things from other point of view which is um the point of view of a historian. I think this partnership is very, was very enriching and very rewarding today. We're going to do a summary of what was on YouTube. We have over a hundred people watching from YouTube and many of them want to go to Germany. I'm going to do a general comment of the things that came up from YouTube before passing to Magali. And I have a question that is my own. 
One of the things that showed up very much here, I'm going to say a question from Camila. She asks if to go to Germany, you have to speak, to go to Germany, you have to speak German. A lot of people want to know if when you go to Germany and an exchange as an exchange student, you have to speak German. A lot of people are afraid of German, uh, Germany. I would like to say to the students that are hearing us that you don't have to speak German to go to Germany. Actually, um, Germany accepts the test of proficiency in English. Maybe Magali and Andrea that are experts in uh, international relationships. It's the only country in the world that pays for the students to study German there. They pay for you to learn Germany, German. They pay for you to stay there uh, and, and, and study German so you don't have to be afraid of the language. Someone asked about print. Print are the post-graduation programs um, connected to, to few crews. We have uh, ANS, IOC, ENI. Out of the Rio de Janeiro campus, we have a few crews in Minas Gerais and a few crews by Bahia. So we have the page of print. And you can look at it um, exactly what it is. I'm going to give you a few figures for you to try to understand why very few Brazilians go to Germany, why our students don't look for Germany, why they miss this opportunity. So just for you to have an idea, I got the data from uh, our sandwich doctorates and from um, students that left in 2019 and 2020, there were 61 grants for doctorates. And from those 61 grants, we had no requests of students to go to Germany. That's sad. So from the researchers that left Brazil, there were 86 grants and only one of them wanted to go to Germany. So I wanted you to comment on that for the students that are listening to us. Why is it so difficult to go to Germany? Is it uh, fear of the language? They don't know that they don't have to speak German. It's, it's a country that receives foreigners so well. I would like all of you to comment on that, comment on that um, opportunity. So you can choose who wants to go first and and make a comment on that. What do you think that we need to strengthen that? I think I'm going to start, if, since if they are Brazilians wanting to go, I'm going to start. I also went through this um, uncertainty. In my case, it wasn't a, a, a requirement to go to Germany. I wanted to learn German, to read the historical sources, to develop my work. Even if I didn't go, I wanted to learn, I had to learn it anyway. I almost changed my object of research because of that. I say this is one of the main factors in my view. It is one of the main factors that prevent Brazilians from going to Germany. I'm sure about that. So it's not only important to say that this varies from area to area. I can talk from the standpoint of biological sciences. I have a friend who went to Germany with me to do his doctorate as well in the medical area, in the area of oncology. And he had a weaker German at the time and he was able to develop very well because his laboratory was very international English. So that wasn't that much of an obstacle. In the case of the history of human sciences, I took part in two seminars on the history of Latin America. So they spoke Spanish, but predominantly they spoke German. So they had to, we, I had to have some domain over German. 
But DAD uh, makes available up to four months for you to stay there exclusively learning, learning German. I didn't do that course, but many colleagues and many friends took it. And it is an incredible opportunity. They send you to a different city than the city that you're going to do your research on. And you, you do an immersion course on German. And I think it's an, a fantastic opportunity for you to learn a new language. And I say that German is the main factor that prevents Brazilians to go to Germany, but I think it's uh, it's solvable. If I may add, I would like to say that in any way, uh, it depends on the area, as Andre said, in the academic area and the university, it depends on the course that you would like to take. You need English, but you don't need German. For you to have an idea, I'm a professor at the university. And here in Germany, the professor is the highest rank that you can get, lower than Dean, of course. But I still teach my classes in English. I don't speak fluent German until today, and it's not a requirement. This shouldn't disencourage people to learn German, of course, because Apart from this need related to work, learning German facilitates all of the other areas of your life here. If you receive a letter from the bank and you don't know if they're charging from you or if you're, they're giving you money, it makes a lot, of, a lot of difference already. Something very interesting that uh, I was remembering when Stefan talked about the World Cup, I came to Germany because I met a German man when I was at Douglas Laboratory, or else I wouldn't consider it Germany at the time. My first decision was going to the United States and it opened doors for me to come here. I came here in 2010 and I was one of the few Brazilians here. And after the World Cup, it was very interesting because that changed a lot. The Brazilians got to know more Germany because of the World Cup. And I remember this because um, the German football team did some social services in Bahia. My brother was rooting for Germany before Brazil played against Germany because he liked it. He thought Brazilian players were snobbish and he saw the German players as uh, disciplined and cool guys. That was such an interesting change because since the World Cup in the next months, I received emails. I remember this email from a guy that worked in petrochemi petrochemistry and he wanted to work with me. He wanted to come to Germany somehow. So how could I help someone that is works in petrochemistry? I work in immunology, but there were people from all over, uh, all areas that wanted to, to, to visit Germany. The World Cup helped that a lot. I, I can't explain why. And something else is that those funding programs started being more enforced and more published in Brazil. When I applied to Humboldt was because the German guy I knew, they recommended it to me. I applied directly here. Because I did that, I, was, I had no obligation of returning here in Brazil. But today you have to do that because of the CAPS funding. It was the same um, methodology, but you applied directly from here. There wasn't a process from Brazil, and today there is, as well as the AAD. There are more programs here that are being published in Brazil and that can clarify those doubts. There is a, a website called Araxis that can answer a lot of the questions for those who want to have an experience or build a career here, especially about the need to speak German. Stefan, just wanted to add that it is what Andre said. Bernardo also said, um, it isn't a matter of opportunity. 
In my case, Carlos Kreff um, contacted my boss. My boss also always had few words for Africa. They never, he never had a project out of this. And Carlos Kreff wanted to study something and he contacted me and my, my boss passed on the project to me for me to take care of it. And it always depends on those people that are open and that see some connection. And if there is any visibility from the part of the research group or from the part of the university, like for the university's reputation or for the research, they have to see if that visibility matches with some uh, open um, branches or open lines. Then things happen. We searched for Rodrigo to find an international collaborator here in Brazil. And, and uh, Rodrigo said, I met, I know Luzia, let's work on a project and earn millions. The project was not approved by the European community, but my grant was. So I went to Brazil. Rodrigo welcomed me. And of course, um, not all the glitters is gold, but we do a lot of sacrifice as a researcher that goes abroad. But as Andre said, it is very rewarding at the end of the day you receive something back. Thank you, I'll pass the floor to Magali. I would like to congratulate you. I love the presentations. Congratulate, uh, congratulations, everyone. I am a fan of the relationships between Brazil and Germany. I've always been because historically, Brazil has a very strong connection with Germany. We have many researchers if you talk about the 19th century there's influence from many areas of knowledge not only in health but human sciences and biological sciences botanics and we had fabulous researchers that implemented in brazil research areas that were fundamental for the development of our country so i'm a big fan of the relationships between brazil and germany and we have to strengthen more and more those historical bonds that are very important for the development of the Brazilian science. Particularly, I think that there is the fear of the language. This is a barrier for our students. They are concerned. Every, almost everybody speaks English and it's very nice for Bernardo to say that. He is a young researcher who is active. He has a research group. He is an important, a university and he still does not speak fluent German and he teaches in English. With English, you can be there, you can position yourself and it's important to um, break this barrier of fear. It's good to learn Spanish, uh, to, to learn German. German, German is a, a beautiful language, but it shouldn't be a barrier for you to achieve your goals. You have to look for your partners there. As Stefan said, there's a lot of important people. There's a lot of active people. Of course, Germany has a history with Africa in the beginning of the 20th century. There's still this big bond with Africa, but there is this bond with us as well. We have a lot of historical important bonds with Germany. And I think this is something important that we have to strengthen. We have to show our students that there is no barrier with the language, but there's all, it is also good to learn. Before going to Germany, André took a course at the Goethe Institute. It was very important for him in the area of human sciences and social sciences. You have to read all the sources and they are in German. And it's good for your daily lives, for you to have a good relationship with your partners, for you to get to know the culture of the people. You're going to uh, enjoy much more if you have the uh, the language, but it is not a hindrance for you to go there. So do participate in this German life. I would also like to ask a question for the three of you, Stefan, who is here in Brazil, and the other two who went there. What were the worst difficulties? 
Stefan, of course, there was a cultural shock. Of course, you like the Brazilian heat, but it is a cultural shock at the end of the day. And also for the Brazilians who went there, what were your main difficulties? Can I start? I think for me, the cultural shock did not exist, truly. I already met people from the South working with Carlos Kreft there between 95 and 1995 and 1996. And I met the Gaúchos that are very similar to the Europeans. And I went to Belo Horizonte and I was very welcomed by, well, welcomed by Fiocruz there. And Mineiro is completely different from Gaúcho. It's a lot of uh, warmth, but they are very, um, they're very suspicious. They, they are suspicious of people. I didn't have that cultural shock in reality. Of course, uh, 20 years ago, very few people spoke good English at Fiu Cruz. Today, it's very different. So I had to use my weak Portuguese to do things. And I learned by doing it. I didn't learn uh, Portuguese uh, that much in Germany, but I learned in Belo Horizonte. But there was no cultural shock for me. They, I was always very well received here in Brazil. Bakery. The bakeries in Germany are wonderful. Didn't you miss the German beer? My mother-in-law, whenever she visits us, she talks about the bread here. But since I'm unmuted, I'm going to take this chance. There were many cultural shocks. And all students that came after me also had many other shocks. But a cultural shock is a, a classic. Our family got here in January, which is the peak of the winter, and we left the Brazilian summer, so that was already a shock. The cultural shock exists in many forms due to that feeling that today, that here is not going to be your country, it's never going to be your people. And sometimes we feel it that way in a, in a place or another. I, I wouldn't say that this is specific from Germany because in the United States, it's like that as well. Bonn is privileged because it's not uh, like Dresden where they have anti-immigrant movements. The cultural shock is interesting because when you get to know the habits of Germans, you see that um, the berries that you thought were, uh, were yours and not theirs. When you, for, for example, when you cross the street, you see the red sign and you look one, at one side and the other side, there's no cars, but the Germans are waiting for the sign to turn green. I think the Steph, I think I thought Stefan was going to say that a foreigner goes to a bar and the waiter mimics, but they understand the foreigner. Here or in France, if you don't speak French or German, and the German, the waiter does not understand you, the waiter just leaves you there. Brazil, Brazilians have this habit of pleasing people. Let's suppose you are driving a car and you're looking for an address because you don't know the street. If I stop my car and I talk to someone, I'm looking for a street such and such. The guy does not know. They are going to say, well, if you turn left there, there's going to be a newsstand and you can ask at the newsstand. If you do the same thing in Germany, if you stop the car to ask for information, the person is going to curse at you because you stop the car in the middle of the street. And if you say, do you know a bakery nearby? The guy says no, and they walk away because they're practical. They don't have the information you need. So Germans are practical. I cannot help you and they walk away. We take this as seeing Europeans and Germans as rude. 
But if you befriend this person later on, you see that it's very different. They're just practical. So these are cultural barriers. When I got here, we got here that I had to deal with the contract and open bank accounts and buy my first cell phone, everything in German. And I asked my friends for help. They said, this is your problem. Handle it. I cannot help you with that. I have other things to do. Once you overcome this cultural shock, your life becomes perfect because all the rest works really well. Bernardo, what you said is extremely relevant. We should understand the other's culture. It's very important also to respect the other's culture and understand that many things are very favorable. They're even positive. When you travel or we go to another country or we go do an immersion course and study, it's important for the student to arrive at the country and understand this, not look at the foreigner as rude. You have to understand the culture of the other so that you can adapt to that, those conditions. I'm sorry, Andrea, I interrupted because I wanted to respond to Bernardo. I think certainly a cultural shock can be an obstacle, but as Bernardo said, I completely agree. I stayed in Germany for one year, tops, so my experience is limited. When I returned um, to Germany in 2012 and 2014, 2018, my perception was completely different than when I went there for the first time. I got to know those codes a little bit better, so I was able to circulate there a little bit easier. Um, the limitation of communication can be very uncomfortable, and I um, forced myself to communicate in German because I wanted to learn the language. Even though you want to learn German to go, don't expect to get to a full domain over the language because it's very hard. And my German, there and I interacted with people. In this DAAD that I mentioned in Bonn, the secretary of DAAD said, forget the declinations, just communicate, forget everything that you learned at the, at the German course. At least the Germans, the ones that I interacted with, were very welcoming and very generous in the sense of seeing your efforts and trying to communicate to you in their language. They always tried to help me and that was very nice. So that was what I wanted to say regarding the language because when you get there and you interact, that's how where things happen in fact. I lived in two different cities. I think Berlin is very sui generis in Germany. I lived three months in Hamburg, which is in the north. It's very different. And then when you get to Berlin, Berlin is very a very lively city. It always seems like the Berlin Wall fell yesterday because the city is always renovating itself. It's becoming more and more, more cosmopolitan. People from all over the world are there. Hamburg is also a very cosmopolitan city because it's a port city, but it's less than Berlin. And I interacted with very different people. This stereotype of formality was broken in the first meeting that I had with my supervisor. I treated him by the formal pronoun. And he said, Andre, I'm sorry, but I would like us to treat ourselves, treat each other, with the informal pronoun, another professor was a little bit more formal. He liked to keep the distance. So you modulate that according to the idiosyncrasies. And there's also a very strong gener uh, generational thing in German. When you're dealing with uh, the youth, it's been 11 years since um, I've been there, but, uh, it, they are much more open. I noticed that they know how to speak English much more than the previous generations. They are more open um, and they were already born in an intercultural society. These are people that lived with the 
generations of immigrants and there is this um, difference in generations that have to be commented. Eu só queria adicionar uma coisa sobre sobre a possibilidade nos dois lados. Eu, eu queria também defender. I would just like to defend Brazil a little bit. Um, I try to establish myself here in Brazil and in Germany. In Germany, the area of tropical medicine is very uh, competitive. Very few institutes, and the vacancies are very limited. There's a lot. There's a lot of struggling. And I tried to establish myself there, and there came a point that I didn't see a future for myself. So an issue is going there as a graduate or a doctoral student for a certain amount of time. And I believe that you're going to have a very rich experience. You're going to learn something nice and take back to Brazil. And here in Brazil, I found more possibilities of making research in my area and applying to entrance exams and uh, applying to universities. In my opinion, in my experience, Brazil offered me a lot more possibilities to establish myself, even with resources um, more that, are, that were more restricted and uh, less beautiful institutes, like Bernardo said. Everyone struggles, but everyone struggles for the same cause. We're not losing hope yet. What I see, what I saw um, along this process, I took entrance exams at Doft Institute in, the Mun in München, in Munich as well. People have to look for opportunities either in Belo Horizonte, in Berlin, in Hong Kong, wherever. You have to fight for your possibilities and opportunities. You have to struggle and you have to chase after opportunities and you're going to um, achieve something. And there's coming, there's going to be, there's going to come a point that you're going to achieve your goals. Thank you very much. Stefan, Andre, and Bernardo, we have only 10 minutes because we have simultaneous translation and the interpreters have a time limit. We have the liberty of um, forwarding your email for people on YouTube because a lot of them are congratulating you and asking for your contact info. So people may contact you later. I'm going to do just a, a general overview of the last things. Itamar wants to know about the print bidding notices and uh, calls. The bidding notices were reviewed, bidding documents, and print is going to um, publish them online, but we are not having students leave Brazil right now because of the pandemic. Lots of people congratulating you. Vanessa took her postdoctorate uh, studies at uh, an institute in Germany, and she liked it very much. And there's a specific question for Professor Andrea Felipe from Leticia Matos, Matos. Do you notice differences in the academic writing between Brazilian and German studies? Do you have any tips for researchers that want to develop projects? There are a lot of questions here about DAAD, if they fund projects. I'm going to have Andre start, and then each one of you can make a final comment before the final words. Maybe a final sentence. What you what would you leave as a as an advice as advice for the students? just for you to give a final message for our students. Thank you very much. And for people who have a Recording lot of Recording in progress. We did a print seminar that were record, that is recorded with the agencies, with Alexander Hubold, the funds, funds process projects. 
So as Stefan said, you have to um, look after the agencies. We'll see after you pass on to them. Let's thank everyone. It was an amazing morning and I wish you all success. Thank you very much. Thank you for the questions. I think there's a difference in writing between Germany and Brazil. The way of writing history in Brazil and the way of writing history in Germany are different. With this um, comprehensive circulation, we have a decrease in those differences, but as we said here, German is more direct, it's more objective. German writing has a difference. For example, I'm used to reading historical documents from the 20th century and German writing has short sentences, more direct sentences. They have a different way of working, but I think some basic principles in the elaboration of, um, of a project. When I sub submitted to DAAD, I did a, a project in English. I don't see this as an obstacle for you to submit projects to Germany. There is a difference in the way of writing and thinking, but this difference is not does not incompatibilize uh, the, a project, for example, it's not an obstacle. I cannot speak about all of the bidding rounds. There is this program of DAAD caps of sandwich doctorates. About uh, undergraduation, I cannot speak about it, I don't know. But there are other agencies like the Alexander von Hubert agency. There are other agencies that uh, grant um, scholarships. In the case of DAD, there are other opportunities for well-established researchers. That is something very good. I recommend very much these research stay in Germany if you have some specific uh, goal it is also a very good opportunity and the opportunities are many this is not DAD not Humboldt they launch bidding rounds with caps but they have their own bidding rounds as well so I recommend you to look at the website which are the programs and which are more appropriate to your requirements identify a partner which is something very university you would like to go, who uh, is working with the research line that is closer to yours, try to contact that person and try to develop a contact, uh, a project in dialogue with this partner. I think this is an extremely important step and those methodological differences that are minimal can be solved within this dialogue as well. It is not something so significant that is going to prevent the partnership. And my message is as I said in the beginning, it takes boldness, it takes courage, but it's extremely rewarding because for me, it is a new way of thinking about the world and thinking about what it is to be Brazilian, what your place in the world is, um, how you can get to know other people, how you can work in a different way. I really like what Stefan said, um, looking for possibilities. Today, we live in a much more connected world. So this distance experience is much more related and uh, much more relative. I think it's worth it. The um, German language is an obstacle. It is challenging, but it it's very worthwhile. As I said in my speech, it's very worthwhile to learn German. Thank you. Bernardo or Stefan? About the first question about decisions of staying in Germany, I'm not going to go in further detail because those, decision in, those decisions involve many things. Personal 
issues, opportunities that may arise here. So um, there were many things involved. One of the mentors, including Luzia, that I had um, just gave me some tips about if I should stay here, if I should go back to Brazil. So one thing led to another. So there are many things that influenced me and it's not the same for everyone. People have different life stories. Regarding to the final message to the students, a scientific career in the academia depends on many things. Depends on your dedication, of course, but it also depends on external factors and luck. If you think that each student, when they start in the scientific career, they are given a project by the PI. And if you think that in 90% of our ideas, they actually don't work, and that's how science works, there are many chances that your project is not going to work, and it's based, uh, based solely on luck. Leaving Brazil or not, you can have a successful career because the only thing that it's under your control is your dedication, your hard work, your pursuit for the opportunities. I'm not saying that this is enough because there's luck as well. As I said, you can dedicate yourself, you can have focus, you can have a goal. I studied marine biology and uh, immunology appeared for me at the end, in the middle of the path and it stole my passion. For example, if my topic is going to be cytokines, where is the best institute? You send an email there, you send an email, send an email to another institute and you try everything you can. So you have to do your part, which is dedicating yourself and chasing after the opportunity. I'm not going to speak a lot about this. I think Bernardo is extremely right. You have to be updated regarding the science and research. You have to be uh, have options from anywhere in the world, either for doctorate programs or master's programs. You have grants. The complicating factor is when you want to be established in the country. This happens all over the world. Nothing is given to you. In my area, in Germany, um, the opportunities were very scarce. So I would have liked to stay in Germany, but at the end of the day, the project, the international project that I joined was very challenging and very interesting as well. And it brought back to me what is expecting me in Belo Horizonte. I lived here for two years and a half. I knew everybody. Since I didn't have many forecasts for the future in Germany, I took my suitcases and I left. And here the struggle continued. I started from scratch. You have to chase after opportunities. You have to integrate yourself. You have to make your projects. You have to produce. It's not only taking caipirinhas at the beach at the end of the afternoon. It's about uh, working and, um, and showing your work. Of course, you have to do nice things, you have to choose good researchers, you have to always be attentive to the exchange offers so that you can find your place. Probably your uh, professor is not going to do that for you. You have to do that for yourself. Now we're going to pass the floor to Andre so that you and I'm sorry to Marcelo so that you and Cristina can close. 
I would just like to make a brief comment. I have to congratulate the round table, the members of the round table. I think it was wonderful. We have no other words. Uh, for those who are watching, on the first session that we had here in Brazil, we commented that one of the intentions that we had in the cycle of discussion is, is awakening motivation in people. So who is watching could see the motivation of everyone. We talked about the logics of culture. Magali mentioned the German culture. And this is for life. I did my postdoc there 2001 and 2002 through um, a program that doesn't exist anymore. And until today, I had the opportunity of coming back other times. We heard three great examples here. And during this panel, I think people had the opportunity to see those experiences and see what they could do. A small addendum, um, Andre mentioned a, an event that he followed when he arrived in Germany. For those who are a little bit more concerned about what is that, a challenge in a foreign country in a language that you don't speak, the fostering agencies, they follow those people. So there's an, accomp uh, an accompaniment program. You are treated as a guest. A word in Germany is guest. You are treated as a guest. So for people to be okay when thinking about uh, taking on a challenge like this, you're treated as a guest. Beatrice put on the chat the link for the event by DAAD. We suggest that people watch it. It's going to be tomorrow and Friday. The recordings are already available. The filmings are, very, are already available. We talk about the scenario in innovation, which one of the big research fronts, but very few innovations are as big as the one that you can cause in yourself. The big entrepreneur is yourself. So you should look at those opportunities and see what you can take from those opportunities that can make a lot of a difference in your professional development. It was a beautiful table, and I will take the uh, pass the floor to Vinicius and Christina to wrap it up. Your words um, summarize very well what all of us already think. It was a very productive morning. I would like to thank you for this partnership in this work group that we already built within this. Um, aspect of print. I would like to hugely thank, thank Magali, which is part of this work group, and Luzia, who is part of the coordination of the print program that put together this idea in this format before we started more specific seminars. I think we reached the goal that we wanted. Marcelo has said that since the beginning with DAAD and the discussions with DAAD and Alexander Humboldt, which is bringing hope, bringing interesting insights for young researchers. Que a gente possa, os, os já bem estabelecidos, também possam trazer essa, todas as parcerias, Fiel Cruz Alemanha. Maybe já... bring those partnerships between Brazil and Germany to a wider um, reality. So we have André Felipe with the historical contextualization. He's our colleague from Fiel Cruz. He's always going to be invited to be with us. Bernardo is also. From Fio Cruz, he's showing clearly all of his experience, so young, but he has a lot of experience in Brazil and in Germany. And in the same sense, we have Stefan in the reverse path. He could uh, see all of the continental issues in Brazil. 
I didn't saw how it is possible. You talked about Rodrigo. Rodrigo roots for Atlético, but how could they let you dress, uh, wear the jersey of uh, Cruzeiro? Yeah, that's the only discrepancy between us, our football teams. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Rita, for all of the support of putting together this structure with Paulira and Léo. Thank you very much for the for Paula, Paulo Lara's team from Video Saúde. Thank you, Dani. And everyone, and I'll pass the floor to our general coordinator of education, Cristina Gillan. Thank you, Vinicius. Thank you for the testimonials of Bernardo, Stefan, and Andre. He fulfilled a role within me of making plans. I think it is a paramount role during this moment of the pandemic. Sometimes we don't have this future perspective. And your speeches fill us with expectations and plans, wishes, desires. And I really like this expression that Vinicius used. He used that as a, a synonym for the older ones, the ones that are already established. So I am already established. I am older, but I have a lot of expectations and a lot of wishes of going back to Germany and talk more to the three people who are with us today. And also Marcelo, our ambassador with the AAD. Magali and Luzia, thank you very much. It was a very happy morning. I would just like to make a small comment. We talked about print, this possibility of a, a sandwich doctorate for the programs that are connected to print. But those who are not can also apply for the sandwich uh, grants. So let's do this, let's move on and believe that there's still a lot of things that we can do. Still a lot of uh, beautiful things that we can do. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm not sure if Rita took her photos. Rita, did you take her photo? I believe she did. I'm sorry, Chris, I was on YouTube, yes. I took the photo and we're going to wait for the final wrap up. Thank you everyone and have a great day. Thank you very much. Já saímos do YouTube? Não, ainda não.